to continue, and I think we're almost in the end of the uh, uh, the sessions. Um, and uh, this um, section is entitled "What's new next for residual risk?" And uh, Alberto Zambon is going to uh, forgive me for my fake French accent, by the way, but uh, is going to tell us about guidelines and what's new and what's next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Toll. And uh, let me express my gratitude to Jean-Charles Jamila, the Board of Trustees, uh, for inviting me to this outstanding meeting in a very friendly and warm environment that I remember has been always like that since probably the first meeting, I guess 15 years ago, right? Something like that. Yeah, exactly. So thank you very much. So the task I've been given, actually, is uh, talk about guidelines uh, uh, and new direction uh, for this lipidemia. If I can get to the next one, I would be the, the happiest man on the world. Actually, the few points I'd like to touch are, let's start with some general uh, uh, assumption and considerations. Um, and then we'll focus more on lipids and what we might have learned from the trial that have been presented and recent trials available on lipids as far as simple messages uh, to convey to probably future guidelines. Current guidelines, similar targets, similar goals, similar problems. Um, the first step uh, to decide the, the appropriate treatment for our patients is basically risk stratification. This is uh, uh, the 2021 ESC guidelines and as you can see here, since we're focusing today our attention on patients with diabetes, as all of you are aware, our patients with diabetes, even without cardiovascular events, fall into the high, very high risk category. Second message, that has clinical implications because the LDL cholesterol reduction needs to be at least 50%, we tend to forget that, and then we have to reach, if possible, challenging goals. 1.4 millimoles or 55 or 70 and 1.8. How do we do that? Well, all the guidelines suggest, and this is appropriate because it's based on the amount and the strength of the evidence available. It's a, a stepwise approach. We start with the starting, we wait, we look at the patient profile. If it's not, we don't reach the goal, we add the zetimibe, we wait again, we look at the patient's profile, and then we add eventually when is available PCSK9 inhibitors in the forms of monoclonal antibodies or uh, the um, small interfering RNA. The problem is the stepwise using a hierarchical order starting than azetimibe than PCSK9 is time consuming, requires multiple visits, um, and it's poorly implemented in real life situation. Now, let me show you another set of guidelines. I'm not gonna go through all the guidelines. These guidelines from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology and the, um, and basically as you see, they uh, set goals according to the um, risk that are similar. Uh, and again, patients with diabetes fall into the high and very high risk categories. And what you're gonna see on the right hand side are basically the approaches, which once again, uh, it's hard to see, but they, they basically start with, after lifestyle, either high intensity starting or moderate switching to high intensity starting, but then you add the zetimibe and you add the PCSK9 inhibitors. I'm not gonna show you all the guidelines. The American Diabetes Association follow exactly the same approach, risk certification, and then a stepwise approach. Now, let me show you one slide. Who of you would follow these? These are the most recent, uh, 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 it's a pathway suggested in 2021 by the European Cardiology Society in uh, primary prevention. Look at this algorithm, this flowchart, and think about, let's say, Pierre, you, to you think about, or you are a neurologist, you're faced with this stuff, as well as the, few minutes ago, we saw the same thing for diabetes, okay? I mean, how can you do? You just have age range, you have to do a score, then you're based on three categories, you have to look at risk modifiers, you have a blood pressure and an LDL goal. Now, the step two, if you're not happy, the LDL goal changes, it's lower. I mean, it's simply not feasible, it's not there. In clinical practice, we don't have time to do that. So that's a wine. 
it's it's uh, unfortunately uh, uh, it's it's a, a failure in our daily practice. You aspire first for those of us that are old enough. Late 80s, patients at goal 28 percent. You aspire five. 30 years later, patients at goal, different goals, different approaches, 30%. So there is definitely something wrong that we can't go beyond. Well, actually, I think the very same people that wrote the guidelines understood that this uh, is a problem. And so what they uh, suggested, and you're going to see actually the, the, the authors are exactly the same, is basically, uh, uh, let me show you first how in the best cardiology centers in Europe this is applied. These are eight out of the top cardiology academic centers in Europe. What they did, they looked at patients uh, and lipid lowering during the admission for acute coronary syndrome and during the first year of follow-up. So at the discharge, 90% was on statin. Very good. 75 on high intensity, the remaining on moderate intensity statin. But look what happened at the follow-up. This is the first visit at one month. So 78% of the patients in this top cardiology unit were not at LDL goal. You may think, well, after a month, they're going to change that therapy. Well, that did not happen. Treatment change goal, 59%. The other one went home exactly with the same therapy. Now, even worse, only 63% had a scheduled second time visit, six months after the discharge. So six months after the discharge, you have still 68% of the patients not at goal, fewer patients, of course, we lost some in the middle. 38% treatment change for patients not at goal, so the majority went back home again with an inappropriate treatment, and only 37% had a final follow-up scheduled. So at the final follow-up, these numbers are very small, from 700 to 168, so a lot of lost. The majority still not at goal, few changes, so at the end of the day, what happens is that in each one of these visits, two-thirds of the patients remain not at goal, and treatment is still not maximal at, at the end of the, at the third visit, after 12 months. This is happening in the best units in Europe. So the winner in this situation is clinical inertia, amazing clinical inertia, and of course, not attainment of LDL goal. Now, that translates, we're talking about diabetes, and this is the most recent survey from the Italian Diabetic Society, and it's 2022. These are 2,000, almost 3,000 patients, and you can see these are patients at target based on high cardiovascular risk or very high cardiovascular risk. 10% at high cardiovascular risk, less at very high cardiovascular risk, and here you see the number less than 55 or between 55 and 70. So if we put them together, we don't reach 20% with an LDL cholesterol less than 70. Now, if we look at the distribution of the, uh, of the drugs that have been given, you can really uh, appreciate why this is happening. If I can have the next one, perfect. So the large majority had statin monotherapy, whether we look at the overall population. Statin azetimibe combination, 7%, 13%. So simply, we're not treating patients properly. And these are centers belonging to the Italian Society for Diabetes. So they should be highly trained. So the situation, it's really bad. But I told you the colleagues understood that this was not the way to go. So um, Professor Koch, Ray, uh, Francois Mac, Lale, and a number of other colleagues, I'm sorry, Lale is not here, but she could comment. They basically issued this suggestion, it's practical, guidance. So cardiovascular risk assessment is still the first step, but then very high risk, you start with combination. Forget about the stepwise approach. And if you are allowed extremely high risk, and you see here who they are, you start with statin, azetimibe, and PCSK9. This is step number one. The only other step is eventually step number two, where in these very high risk people, you add either PCSK9 or benpedoic acid. So it's two shots either at the hospital and one follow-up, or if you visit it as an outpatient clinic, just one follow-up visit. Now, this has been seen to be highly effective because it's simple, very simple, effective on LDL from the very beginning, safe, uh, and if you have fixed those combinations, of course, adherence, uh, it's, it's improved. The colleague said, forget about the wait and, and, and look and watch program paradigm that we had, and start treating all very high and extremely high-risk patients with combination therapy that should be our basic standard of care.
colleagues that treat hypertension already have combination therapy as a basic stand. Diabetologist, I mean, Bob, let's, I mean, I don't know why I ask, I mean, lipidologist, we kind of woke up 10 years later. Now, the other point is that we look at patients with diabetes. This is extremely nice uh, piece of information. It's coming from the first trial, Racing. The original trial was published last year in The Lancet in July. These are diabetic, the subpopulation in the Racing trial, where they look at the moderate intensity statin and the zetimibe, mostly in a single pill combination, as compared to high intensity statin. And this is mostly 80 milligram of atorvastatin. Now, when you look at the event rate, three years, there is no difference. In fact, uh, the, the lower curve belongs to the moderate intensity statin azetimibe, which is basically 20 milligram atorvastatin and azetimibe as compared to 80 milligram. Now, not only that, but if you look at adherence, it's much better significantly fewer people stopped or changed their therapy. And at the end of the first, the second, and the third year, more people had an LDL cholesterol significantly more below 70 or 1.8 millimole. So, I mean, that's the proof that what, uh, you know, we've been suggesting, azetimibe is around since 2003. Now, giving moderate dose of statin and azetimibe provides you with the better LDL control, and it's overall, the overall population show exactly the same results then going on with the top intensity statin. And this has been proved, and this is the uh, 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 take-home message suggesting that this is a reasonable alternative. Let me focus on the interesting part, the lipids. But let's go back to the uh, combination therapy, because again, focusing on diabetics, I think we have interesting results from the IMPROVE-IT trial. Now, first of all, this is what uh, the guidelines suggest you may get in terms of LDL cholesterol reduction when you have azetimibe with the high intensity statin. Now look at the line below. This is what you get with PCSK9 monotherapy, 60%, 65% with this combination. I don't know in your countries, but in, I think in Europe, there, there are plenty of combination rosuvastatin, azetimibe, atorvastatin, azetimibe, and one month it's 10 euros. So it's 120 euros a year worth of therapy. They're all generic. Now the improve it trial that was positive, we saw the improve it this morning, but when they looked at patients with and without diabetes, they found that the population driving the results in improving were really patients with diabetes. I mean, without diabetes, oh, the important thing is that both population had exactly the same level at the end of the study of LDL cholesterol, 55. So it doesn't depend on LDL cholesterol, that's a puzzling result. <laughs> so what happens is that uh, um, after seven years you had a 5% absolute rate reduction, risk reduction in patients with diabetes, 14 relative risk reduction against 2% in those without diabetes. Now, that triggered uh, the possibility that patients with diabetes were at somehow at increased benefits in, for the combination, and that is true because when they looked at the other trial comparing patients in the trial with diabetes and patients in the trial without diabetes, these are statin and azetimibe, you can see that the MACE reduction was significantly greater in those with, and we're talking about, you know, about 7,300 patients with diabetes, was greater in those with diabetes than in those without diabetes. Now, after what we heard yesterday from Chris and this morning from, from Marsu, we have data that might explain why, despite the LDL being the same, we may get extra benefit by the combination in patients with diabetes. There are data from Italy, but from Europe and from many, uh, actually, U.S. groups that suggest, and it's understandable, how the azazetimibe works by reducing the absorption of cholesterol in the gut. So you basically change the postprandial lipemia. This is placebo after a fat meal, and this is ApoB48 levels after azetimibe. So you basically modulate postprandial lipemia, and postprandial lipemia is a major issue, as we, we saw yesterday, in patients with diabetes particularly. So on top of a statin, which is already has effect, maybe adding a zetimide provides you this extra benefit. And that's why, actually, you have extra beneficial results in terms of uh, cardiovascular risk reduction. Is that the end of the story? Well, uh, what we see in, in, in patients treated with a statin trial, let's say, I should get the first... Okay, great. Uh, is statins are effective in patients with diabetes in decreasing events. Six statin trials, one with moderate towards and against intensity, high intensity statin. So as you can see here, in patients in this trial that had diabetes, there was a significant reduction as compared to those on placebo. But let me uh, show you a, a cross-group connection, uh, um, sorry, uh, results. So if we compare the event rate in those on statin, or let's say 
on 80 milligram of atorvastatin versus 10, these are real placebo, well, still higher than those patients in this trial that did not have diabetes and received either nothing or 10 milligram of atorvastatin. So there is something uh, going on in patients with diabetes, and I think the Fourier trial provided us with uh, uh, the idea that this is really the case, because these are patients on evolocumab and high-intensity statin, an LDL cholesterol of about 0.8 millimoles, uh, left panel patients with diabetes, right without diabetes, in the same Fourier trial, and you can see here the event rate observed in patients with diabetes at 30 milligrams evolocumab high-intensity statin is higher than those in the Fourier trial, without diabetes on high intensity statin alone. So, I mean, there is something going on in patients with diabetes. It must not only be lipids, but definitely the signal is something is going on. And as, as uh, I, I'm not going through all the details that Chris and Marsu showed us that are accounting for these differences, but this has been acknowledged by a number of societies, including the European Society of Cardiology and Atherosclerosis, suggesting there is a causal association, particularly between triglyceride-rich lipoprotein remnants and the cardiovascular events. In situations, as diabetes, for example, uh, where there is either overproduction or inefficient lipolysis, leading to an accumulation of these end products, calomicron remnants, that are small enough to cross the endothelial barriers at a different stage contributing to the atherothrombotic process. Also, because of the lipolytic pro uh, products uh, that uh, results from lipolysis, lipoprotein lipase action on these lipoproteins, they may interfere and impair uh, endothelial function, platelet aggregation. So maybe when Chris said not all APOB-containing lipoproteins are the same, maybe there are pathophysiological reasons, reasons why probably these chylomicron remnants or, or triglyceride-rich lipoprotein remnants are really bad. Um, what are the suggestions and what can be changed according to uh, the current guidelines when we look at triglyceride-rich lipoprotein. Because with the LDL cholesterol, the message is clear. I don't think we can go far beyond that because we have tools that basically wipe out the LDL from the face of Earth, actually. 20 milligram, 10 milligram, 5 milligram. Sometimes, because they calculate with the Friedvas formula, I have patients coming back with, I mean, said, okay, look, I have minus 10 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. I said, well, that's hard to get, but anyway. So, what we are left with, and this is the 2021 European Society of Cardiology, European Atherosclerosis Society is the same, we have first option, of course, level and class are less, far less than statins, where they basically say, okay, on a statin, providing you reach a good LDL, when triglycerides are high, use a fibrate. They specifically mention phenol. Or they say, well, you can use a cosapentethyl, and the range of triglycerides is much broader. You see, it starts at 135 or 100.5 millimole, again, on a statin and high TG. Now, the, this, is, again, is the, European, this is the American Association for Clinical Endocrino Endocrinologists. Um, the American Diabetes Association uh, does not suggest combination with phenol. said that there is no point to do a uh, fibroid statin because we don't have evidence of positive results, nor with niacin. Here, on the other hand, they are more elaborate and say, well, Triglyceride between 135 and 500, okay, you, of course you use a treat, uh, uh, you know, aggressively the risk factors, but uh, triglyceride above 135, I cause a pentatil, four grams, eventually fibrates. Uh, triglyceride, and these are patients with cardiovascular disease and patients with diabetes, or patients with diabetes and at least two risk factors, no cardiovascular disease nor diabetes, you may consider fibrates. So these are the suggestions. Now, la, these are the panorama of the drugs we have. Um, let's focus on the blue ones. The uh, orange bars tells you what we get in terms of LDL cholesterol, including the obicetropib. Uh, the blue ones, uh, and of course here you see whether we have documented cardiovascular benefits, are associated with a little bit controversial messages, fibrates. Well, recent data, you know, cast some doubts about the effectiveness on reducing cardiovascular events. Omega-3 fatty acids, we have strength, we have reduced it. A little bit of a confusing issue as well. And for the other three that are the angiopoietin antibodies, angiopoietin against angiopoietin-like uh, three, or the antisense oligonucleotide, we definitely have evidence of a remarkable effect, but no cardiovascular outcome data, okay? So this is what we're left when we try to focus on triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Now, 
let me go back to a slide that was part of the talk and the, uh, the debate and very nice we had yesterday. Can I have the next one, please? Okay, these are our lipoproteins. Yesterday the debate was, is it cholesterol? Is it triglyceride? Is it non-HDL cholesterol or it's ApoB? Now, as you all know, because of course the audience is, is made up by a, a worldwide expert, as, as Professor Libby said, you know the meaning of ApoB. It, it's one ApoB per atherogenic particle. So I like to compare the LDL measurement as something, a very powerful zoom on a panorama. You get the detail. The non-HDL cholesterol is a wide angle but low resolution picture. The ApoB is a wide angle, high resolution picture of a panorama. So my personal belief, old school from Seattle actually, is ApoB should be better. I know we're not measuring ApoB routinely. We do measure non-HDL. It's simple. But it should be probably a better uh, uh, marker or a better risk factors. Uh, if I can have the next one. This is something that uh, Chris showed yesterday. It's based on genome-wide association, uh, based on a large database, UK Biobank, but not only Biobank, where they did some Mendelian randomization on a univariate and on a multivariate uh, way. Univariate LDL cholesterol, triglyceride, ApoB, they were all associated, actually, uh, with an increased risk of cardiovascular events per one standard deviation of higher uh, uh, risk factor. But once they did the adjustment, the only one that came out really strongly associated with the disease was ApoB. Now, as, as Chris said, not all the ApoB lipoproteins are the same. That puzzled me, but I do, I do believe that's the case. But very simple-minded guy, this is a very powerful slide showing that the ApoB, it's probably what we should look after. Now, let me uh, go again. And so apolipoprotein B, uh, that's the conclusion. It's probably the predominant trait that accounts for etiological relationship of lipoprotein and cardiovascular risk, risk of coronary artery disease. This is a study published by Brian Ferenc when they looked at uh, genetic, common genetic variants affecting ApoB lifetime. Now, the blue ones are genetic variants that are affecting genes encoding targets for triglyceride-lowering therapy. As you can see here, PIPAR alpha, angiopoietin 4 and 3, and so forth. The red labels here, PCSK9, for example, NPC1, like 1, HNG mucoar adductase, are genetic variants impacting on genes that are targets, actually, for LDL cholesterol lowering therapy. Now, as you can see here, there is a nice association with progressively and lifetime lower ApoB levels associated with these genetic variants and product, uh, progressive reduction in coronary heart disease. No matter what are you looking at, genes that are impacting on triglyceride lipoprotein, genes that are impacting on LDL, genes that are impacting on lipids in other ways, the ApoB is here. So one of the things that uh, Brian Ferenc, this is courtesy of Professor Catapano, Brian Ferenc, and uh, uh, Federica Gallimberti, when they looked at lipids, and they look at ApoB changes in these trials or in this, uh, within this class of lipids, azetimib, oh, sorry, statin, azetimib, CTP inhibitors, fibrates, niacin, PCSK9, what they found is that the progressively greater uh, uh, effect on ApoB in terms of decrease, a greater effect in terms of coronary artery disease. This is, it's maze, really, to the point that they said, okay, how much we need to lower ApoB to have a similar effect to one LD, a millimole of LDL cholesterol? They found out it's about 30 milligrams of ApoB. The point they drew from this paper is that the clinical effect on cardiovascular events of any lipid-lowering medication, it's probably proportional to the absolute changes in ApoB in the atherogenic lipoprotein that results from that approach. Now, um, we saw this trial yesterday. And actually, uh, as, as uh, Jean-Charles mentioned, I was really surprised when the results came out because, okay, this is 20 years ago, but these are, and our post-hoc analysis or subgroup analysis, this is exactly the lipid phenotype I would expect to draw benefits from a fibrate on top of a statin. Very different background as compared to 20 years ago. Field had no, I mean, real placebo. Accord had single statin, not high-intensity statin. So it's a different, different goals and different background. 
So we all know the results and we all know the changes in lipids because that's the other point. So it was really effective in decreasing triglyceride, if we can have this in the next one. Um, and actually decreasing triglyceride and VLDL cholesterol, it was effective. But on the other hand, if I can have the next one, if we move our attention towards the uh, columns on the right, there was a, an increase in ApoB. I'm not saying that PIMA is not effective. In the context of a high intensity starting background, PIMA does not provide any extra reduction in ApoB. So let's put in the context of the ApoB figure I showed you before, the uh, PIMA fiber trial. Uh, the reason why I did this, uh, they did this analysis, these are trials that lasted at least five years. And most of them, not all of them, had placebo. Like the VA hit was gen fibrosis versus placebo. So the real effect of gen fibrosis and ApoB containing lipoprotein field was mostly gate placebo. And as you can see here, field, although it's not very powerful, but you know, the effect falls exactly where you would expect based on the ApoB reduction. Now the PIMA fibrate trial, it fits right there. Zero effect on ApoB. Again, it's not saying that gem fibrosis and, and phenofibrate are more effective. The background is different. This is the real effect of the fibrates against placebo. This is the extra effect of PIMA fibrate on top of a very effective lipid lowering approach, such as a high intensity statin. But that's exactly where it's supposed to be, based on the ApoB reduction. Now, let me go. And so basically, the triglyceride lowering without a decrease in the number of particles, probably it's not enough to result in any benefit. Now, let me give you a, the other example that is confusing a lot of people. These are, this is reduced, so patients uh, uh, that, uh, uh, these are patients with diabetes, so no cardiovascular disease, but at least another risk factors. The LDL cholesterol nicely controlled, 74, hypertriglyceridemic, 216, a number of issue, I may answer you, but with the mineral oil in the placebo group, but we did get a tiny, tiny decrease in ApoB. I'm not looking at eight milligrams because that's against placebo. Placebo went up, you know? So it's two milligrams of the further decrease in ApoB. It's a further decrease in CRP, inflammation, not 39, it's about 20% decrease in, in CRP. No effect whatsoever on LDL cholesterol. And now we have back-to-back -back strength. I mean, highly significant. This is, uh, you know, total number of events. This is first event in reduce it. So extremely significant. If you go across the range of each clinical endpoint seen in reduce it, they all decreased effectively, I mean, in significant strength, not even a sign. Now, if we look at ApoB changes in strength, there were some problems with the recruitment, sorry, uh, let's go back one. Um, ApoB didn't change at all, one to 2%, zero effect in those on four grams of mix EPA DHA versus icosapentatil four grams a day. So let's go back to this figure then. So if this is that the two fibrates and prominent, well, the strength, it's there. The real puzzling question is that reduce it is not there because reduce is at the minor ApoB reduction, but still a great effect. So what's going on with reduce it? Reduce it is the only trial that really falls really outside the line. Well, one answer is, uh, and it's the next slide, is that the effect of four grams of icosapentatil were seen regardless of the baseline triglycerides. Not only regardless of the baseline triglycerides, but regardless of the, L, the, the LDL cholesterol. They were seen where the LDL cholesterol was below 67 or above 84, which suggests that icosapentatil's effects are probably there independently of the baseline lipid profile or the baseline or the effect of icosapentatil on lipids. And in fact, if you look at the trial, there was uh, an increased number of minor bleedings in those with icosapentatil and that little but significant further decrease in CRP. I like to remind you that these are all on the background of statin therapy. If you put azetimibe on top of a statin, you don't get any further decrease in CRP. Maybe with PCSK9, but not sure. Icosapentatil had a further decrease in CRP. So, just to, if I can get to the next one. So really what we have here, if we put in the context of ApoB, our triglyceride lowering agents, we can say that, well, the fiber, it's either had a minor decrease or no changes or a minor increase depending on the background of the population and the therapy, actually. 
against placebo, probably a minor decrease in the most recent trial because of the background, no changes or a slight increase. Omega-3 fatty acid, if I can get the next one, thank you, at the best a minor reduction with icosapentatil, not much with the, D, e, the DHA, uh, EPA used in strength. If I can get the next one, please. Now, we have the three injectable new options for uh, lowering triglyceride, extremely powerful. Uh, I think Marsu uh, hinted this morning, uh, Chris as well. They do have a, a, a decrease in APOB in the trials. Of course, we don't have outcome trials, so, and they are tested uh, mainly uh, uh, testing the effect on severe genetic forms of this lipidemia, either severe hypercholesterolemia or hypercalomicronemia. So we don't have planned trial to look at cardiovascular events with these molecules that are extremely powerful. Um, APOC3, a significant reduction, probably the strongest reduction in APOB, and again, the uh, antisense oligonucleotide against angiopoietin 3, uh, a moderate reduction. So, but this is the thing we have. So let me give you a few hints about what I think are going to be the direction, then a final slide, just to remain almost in time. So I think one thing is we need to streamline our suggestions, the, but not changing the way guidelines are done, because the, the guidelines are written based on evidence, strength of evidence, amount of evidence. Simply, when we need to translate into practical uh, you know, life and daily practice, they need to have a section where they say, okay, guys, this is what we suggest, but in practical, you need to do this, not go back and forth, because it doesn't happen. So that happens in the recent paper. My feeling is that uh, a two-step approach is probably the best we can do. One visit and then a control to basically fine-tune uh, our, our lipid-lowering approach. Combination therapy, like our colleagues from hypertension and diabetes told us many, many years ago, is probably the standard of care. Particularly in patients with diabetes, for the reason I showed you uh, in terms of uh, azetimibe and the, the extra benefit that we see in patients with diabetes. Can I have the next one, please? Um, yep. Okay. APOB, I know it's difficult. It's going to be slow, the process, but APOB to me, it looks probably the uh, uh, picture in terms of risk stratification, in terms of management of cardiovascular disease, and effect we can expect from lipid-lowering agents, the number one target. In the meantime, non-HDL is fine. I'd like to remind you the SCORE2 table includes non-HDL as, as a parameter to calculate and stratify the risk. So it's, it's already there. So it's fine. Um, APOB is better to me. Um, the existing and future lipid-lowering approaches should measure their effectiveness based probably on the effect of APOB, on top, for example, of the available therapy, like what happened in Prominent. I'm not saying the overall effectiveness, but the effectiveness on top of what is the best standard of care. And can I have the next one, please? Okay. That multiple components in certain populations, like patients with diabetes, for example, we, uh, uh, we saw yesterday patients with chronic kidney disease, there are components, and Peter told us, that are really effective when you address them, like inflammation and chronic kidney disease in patients with diabetes. And I think the proof is how effective was icosapentatil, independent of lipids, baseline lipids and lipid effect on treatment, actually. So I think these are some of the hints that should be taken into account by the guidelines. This is the last slide. Let me... Uh, update this uh, simple two-step approach. This is highly effective on APOB, and it's highly effective for also the postprandial effect on lipids in patients with diabetes. Now, and you can maybe adjust by adding uh, uh, either benpedoic acid or PCSK9, but this should be the base, baseline approach in our patients. Now, the farther step, if I can go one ahead, the guidelines suggest persistently high TG-rich lipoprotein. That's probably not the case, or not the case anymore, according to what both Marsu and, and Chris said, because that might not be the way to identify the patients that might need from an extra reduction. What the guidelines suggest now, so probably, uh, if I can have just an X, probably we should replace that with APOB and non-HDL cholesterol, though that remains at higher APOB despite a nice control of LDL cholesterol. They might benefit by uh, using an, well, I would say, lipid-independent 
uh, uh, approach, which is four grams a day of icosapentatil. We know it affects inflammation, platelet aggregation. We may use fibrates. Now, what we can expect is, uh, if anything, a minor impact on ApoB, but fibrates do work on microvascular disease. This is a major issue in patients with diabetes. Macrovascular disease cuts our life expectancy shorter, but life is miserable for patients with diabetes and retinopathy or nephropathy or peripheral neuropathy. So I think we should keep in mind that fibrates can also be used for microvascular disease. None of these drugs has been proven effective on microvascular disease. Now, last but not least, we may have some further boost in terms of further decrease in ApoB in this specific subject by the new injectable agents. But what I see is far ahead in front of us. So I think the irony is that we are left with one backed up on, on clinical data with one approach with icosapentate that works not lowering triglycerides. And this is what guidelines suggest as uh, a step to uh, use in patients on with elevated triglyceride. Thank you very much for your attention.